Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a good conference. It is really nice to be talking here about interoperability. In um, Hyperledger Global Forum 2020, we had like the first contact with Hyperledger Active. And after being working on the project for a while, uh, we've seen that it has evolved so much, which also motivates this work. So um, in this presentation, uh, Dina and I are going to talk about um, formalization, systematization, and standardization of blockchain interoperability, uh, a joint effort uh, between uh, some Hyperledger members showing that uh, an interdisciplinary approach is needed to solve this problem. So um, probably you're all familiarized with interoperability, um, but essentially it helps us bring liquidity to other networks. It helps us uh, scale our blockchain solutions, and it also helps us reduce risk uh, by, for example, uh, migrating our applications to a more secure blockchain or pegging our security to a stronger blockchain. However, we've seen that blockchain bridges, so the most um, uh, typical cross-chain use case, have been constantly hacked. Um, namely, we have seen about one and a half billion of dollars in damages just this year. And um, despite uh, several uh, academic works and industry works on the topic, uh, we've seen these attacks. So we would like to mitigate these attacks. And our hypothesis is that by formalizing um, blockchain interoperability and then instantiating our solutions with this more general model, we may help mitigating some of the attack factors. So this is one, uh, um, one summary of the uh, bridge exploits from last year. Right, so our first step is trying to understand the interoperability landscape. And we've done a f uh, some work in the area. We have a survey uh, published at ACM Computing Surveys where we try to make sense of the heterogeneity of the area. Basically, we aggregate interoperability solutions into uh, different categories based on a set of criteria. And uh, one of the insights that is important to understand is that interoperability is not solely asset transfers. So bridges are not the only use case for interoperability. For example, uh, Hyperledger Cactus and Weaver, now called Cacti, um, support more general types of interoperability. So we can have cross-chain use cases that are not solely asset transfers. Uh, it's also interesting to observe that there are some cross-chain uh, APIs, so APIs that allow you to connect to several blockchains and perform computation based on the results. For example, Ubiquiti's cross-chain uh, app, which is from Blockdaemon, and, and many others. So when we're reasoning about interoperability, it's important to understand what is the object that you want to interoperate. So we call this the interoperation mode. And we divide it into data transfers, asset transfers, and asset exchanges. Asset exchanges are different from asset transfers. And I'll explain a bit later how, how is that. And then we want to measure, can the system interoperate with other systems as it is? We call this the potentiality of a system. And we measure this with what we call the P-levels. And then we have the C-levels for compatibility. And it answers the questions if two systems can interoperate with others as they are. We'll explain this uh, soon. So data transfer, very simple, typically. We have a piece of data on a source blockchain, an interoperability mechanism in the middle, or interoperability solution. We copy that to the target blockchain via the IAM. Typically, we also might provide some proofs of validity, but uh, not necessarily. Then we have asset transfers. So the idea here is to move an asset from a source blockchain to a target blockchain. And we usually do this by locking the asset on the source blockchain and minting a representation of that, of that asset on the target blockchain. Note that the idea here is to keep the total circulation of that asset consistent across chains. So that's why we need to lock and unlock. Otherwise, the, the asset is not pegged or backed up by anything on the source chain, which is problematic when bridges are hacked. 
So for example, if the target blockchain is hacked and the funds are drained, or the other way around, if the funds are drained on the source blockchain, the minted assets on the target blockchain will lose its peg and therefore its value. So we lock, then we have a mighty uh, entity in the middle, can be more centralized or more decentralized, that asserts for the validity of that transaction, and then the asset is minted on, on the target blockchain. Then we have asset exchanges. So asset exchanges do not require a burn mint or a lock mint mechanism, but rather the depositor locks some value or some asset in, in an escrow contract. Right? This as escrow contract can be redeemed by providing a pre-image of a cryptographic hash, which is called a secret. In other words, if I have the secret, I can redeem funds. So visually, we have Alice and Bob on chain NNB. Alice creates a secret, which is um, uh, it's hidden by a cryptographic hash. And then uh, she locks the transaction into this vault, this smart contract, such that if Bob provides the red key, he can get the asset. Right? That's the transaction where he gets the assets. And similarly, Alice, um, Bob deploys a smart contract on his chain, such that if Alice provides the key, he can, the Alice can redeem the funds. And the point of interest here is that the, the key is the same. So when Alice opens the vault and redeems the, the funds, Bob gets the key and can use it on the first one to redeem the funds. So both parties get the funds and both parties use atomic transactions on their own blockchain. So you only need uh, some synchronization happening off chain for this to happen. Right, those are the P levels. I'll be really quick about this. The uh, intuition is that the higher the P level, the stronger the interoperation uh, system. So for example, level P1 is interoperability across smart contracts. If you saw um, any Weaver presentation, there's a, si a very similar diagram. Uh, and for example, level P3 is interoperation across different DLT networks, but same subnetworks, same functionality. So level, level uh, P3 could be across Ethereum, um, different Ethereum networks. Level P4 could be across different DLT protocols such as Polkadot and Hyperledger Fabric or Ethereum and Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, the C levels. So level C1 is compatibility on the semantic layer, meaning that there is a protocol that is understood by two different systems. So for example, an asset transfer protocol that's instantiated on a set of blockchains. Level C2 uh, includes um, synchronization at the organizational level, meaning that there are some agreements uh, across organizations that uh, enable the fulfillment of a common goal. For example, when we have bridging projects that have a collaboration to use shared infrastructure across several blockchains, we have organizational layer compatibility. And finally, we have legal uh, compatibility, which conforms to jurisdictions, laws, regulations, etc. And there is not a lot of work on that field as far as we know. All right, so then our systematization deliverable, we look at the P levels, C levels, and uh, D stands for data transfer, AT asset transfer, and AE asset exchange. If we want, for example, a P4, C1, and asset transfer solution, we look into these columns, right? And we check which one has the tick, so the, the last rows. And this indicates us that these rows here, those solutions provide the requirements that we need for, um, so those are interoperability solutions that support those P levels, C levels, and so on. And now I would like to call uh, Dina to present our efforts on formalization. Okay, so thanks Rafael. I think till now you would have seen what we can call a system systematization of uh, different solutions that are available for interoperability and in terms of both techniques and the interoperability modes supported I mean, across various dimensions, right? So now we'll try to think about what it would take to formalize 
or to come up with a formal definition for an interoperability protocol. Right? So this is uh, work uh, in progress that Rafael and I are doing with uh, Hart Montgomery from the foundation and uh, uh, colleagues from the IBM India Research Lab, Shikhar and Rama, who is in the audience. And uh, the goal of this work is to come up with a cryptographic definition that if someone comes up with an uh, interoperability protocol, we can check if it's secure, right? So what does it mean by secure is, uh, let's say if you want to come up with an encryption protocol, right? So that's something cryptographers came up with the definition, I don't know, a few decades ago. And uh, one common thing that you would do is encrypt uh, using your protocol, uh, encrypt zero using your protocol, and then let's say encrypt one using your protocol, right? If you give it to someone who is trying to bake the protocol either with encryption of zero or the encryption of one, right? And if they cannot distinguish between them, then that means that your protocol is secure. So that, that's usually like one like very simplified way of saying uh, your encryption protocol is secure, right? You can have uh, like building on top of this seminal work from four decades ago, for any cryptographic primitive, we always first try to come up with what a formal definition of security means for the primitive, and then we try to propose protocols for that because when we propose protocols, we want to say whether it's satisfying the properties that we're defining for it or not. So similarly for interoperability, what we aim to do is to build on the formalization that exists for individual blockchain ledgers. Right? There has been a line of work trying to formalize the security of Bitcoin ledger, starting with that to generalizing it for permissionless ledger to permission ledgers, to also include Corda like any decentralized ledger technologies, people are distributed ledger technologies, people are trying to come up, uh, have, have come up with formal definitions for individual blockchain ledgers. So the crux of this work is to build on top of it to formalize interoperability protocols. So what does it take to formalize interoperability protocol? Right? So here, it could be interoperation between two different individual networks, which means like they are fundamentally different in terms of, I don't know, like how they uh, let people in, like uh, the participants of the network, or they can be fundamentally different in terms of the consensus mechanisms, or in terms of, uh, let's say, I don't know, the signing protocol used, how uh, data is stored in the ledger, and, and so on, right? And the derivatives of it. And even inside a protocol, there are different uh, different parts involved. Right? In the individual ledger, we have consensus, uh, the ledger, and the, as I mentioned before, the membership provider. And also when communicating with other ledgers, you also have uh, contracts for cross-ledger ID management or like cross-ledger uh, verification of data that's coming from the other ledger or in uh, maintaining logs and other things. So one of the, the these, this is one of the main challenges of formalizing uh, interoperability is that there are different moving blocks and we have to come up with a model that, uh, right, we have to come up with a model that is aware of all these things and it's secure even then. So this is where we use this notion of uh, universal composability. I'm not going to talk about what it means. This is just to motivate that if there are like multiple pieces of a protocol or if a particular protocol is going to be used as a part of a larger system with other things, uh, it's very common, or if this protocol is, different instances of this protocol are used in conjunction, right? In such a scenario, it's very common, uh, it's, it's natural to use this notion of universal composability. To give an analog in cryptography when people use this is, let's say if you're trying to use a signature scheme with some parameters, some public parameters, and uh, let's say you're trying to use the similar, uh, or the same, the secret key, public key pair for an encryption scheme. I mean, some of the signature schemes and encryption schemes, they're compatible in terms of public key, private key parameters, so it's okay to use it, right? But uh, even though the key, like the mathematics of the key are compatible, it's not always secure if uh, they are used like in conjunction. Right? So sometimes it like they don't naturally do. Uh, and also if you have different instances of, if you use the same parameters for, let's say different other protocols as well, the randomization of the secrets that you use, it's not clear whether it's secure or not. And uh, people have seen in the literature that this notion of universal composability has a good way of capturing whether 
the repeated use of the parameters are done correctly or not or when like yeah as i mentioned before whether the protocol is used in conjunction with other instantiation of the same protocol or different protocols uh, it, to check whether it's done well this notion of universal composability helps and since we have a lot of moving pieces we will also try to use we have also tried to use this for formalizing uh, coming with the formal definition for interoperability and for interoperability specifically the some of the specific things as any of you who are like have seen it before will be aware of is we will a particular ledger will need to have uh, a couple of properties which are more than uh, what it would need if it not were to support interoperability like it would need some level of synchronization uh, a kind of a clock and uh, some guarantees with respect to the clock so that it's feasible to interoperability with another network and the second thing is it needs to support locking right to enable atomicity across ledgers so locking is another fundamental property so some of these is what we'll try to capture uh, what we had tried to capture in our formal definition and uh, this is the only sort of the math term that i will use in this slide is we do this by defining appropriately defining rules right and uh, see the transition like appropriately defining rules and the transition of the state and the set of rules so we associate with a particular state of the ledger uh, a set of rules and then we define transition functions which go from uh, the state set rule pair to uh, the updated state set uh, updated rule set tuple and uh, uh, the transition function outputs uh, i don't know one if the update from the previous uh, tuple to the new tuple is valid and zero otherwise so by appropriately crafting these things is how we came up with the definition uh, i and uh, right and we model this as a two layer universal composability model the first layer captures the definition of the single ledger functionalities uh, and okay the second layer is uh, about the system of interoperable ledgers right and the first layer uh, there is a prior work called f ledger which formalizes the secure definition for all uh, dlt technologies and uh, we build on top of that to have some interop enablers like checking whether the transition the, ru the rules transition function is uh, is one of the interop enabler right so that's uh, is the first layer of the uh, uc model the second layer is the system of multiple interoperable ledgers which contains things like the global clock or uh, the atomic summit functionality and uh, similar things which uh defines how a cross ledger functionality would look like right so this is capturing the formalism effort at a, a very very high level uh, do talk to us if you have any more questions after this session we just kept it at a high level because like it might be like appropriate for a wider audience right okay and like once we define this formally there are two steps of uh like once we write down the formal definition we'll have to first show that the individual ledgers are according to what f ledger plus is asking for right like fabric uh, corda besu we would want to or ethereum main so we'll have to prove that those are according to f ledger plus and then we'll have to prove that uh, cacti initially we thought okay we'll prove two use cases one for weaver one for cactus when we started two years ago okay now it's merged so <laughs> we'll have to prove that the different kind of functionalities that uh, each of these support are uh, secure under this model right so that's uh, i mean this is one one uh, excerpt from the weaver deck we'll, we have like multiple functionalities like sharing data like rafael mentioned data transfer asset exchange and uh, a version of identity management uh, recently and the event public and publication subscription so uh, like we'll have to, as after we write down the formal definition we'll, have, we'll be proving that uh, the protocols are secure under this definition okay so that's that with the formalization part the next is about the standardization effort uh, which is a, a task force under ietf we're trying to formally uh, like get into the ietf working group uh, so we call it the secure asset transfer protocol the sat p uh, group and uh, 
I guess like a couple of us in the audience, I think, who have been part of the working groups, right? So the scope of this working group is actually, yeah, this picture captures it, right? So there will be gateways that uh, single or multiple gateways that lie in front of uh, each of the network. And uh, the scope of this working group is to define the communication between gateways and mainly to facilitate the secure asset transfer protocol. Right, uh, and uh, what all do we have here? Like mainly we try to formalize the, the API the endpoint definition uh, in the gateways, and then, and the description of uh, like resource identifiers, right? Uh, the, like how can, how can you craft the query or the request to be made to the other network? So that's, that's also part of it. Right, and how do you define each asset in a net in a network? So that's the resource identifier, and then we'll also trying to formalize the payload uh, definition for different kinds of uh, payloads that would be the communicated across the gateways during uh, the cross digit protocol, and then the the protocol itself for the secure asset transfer. Right. Uh, so there is a charter. Uh, there's a draft charter, and like so, it all has gained a lot of uh, traction over the last couple of months and there was a like a Bob session in Philadelphia a uh, couple of months ago. So after that, uh, the group has trained the data fraction and like getting formally uh, involved with IETF recently. So uh, there are like sort of two or two or three main drafts and then uh, some uh, associated drafts currently we're thinking about. First is the, uh, the asset transfer protocol and then the architecture and then the, the use cases document to augment that. And also after doing that, we'll also have the, the views data sharing document, which will have the, the definition for the view and view addresses for the data sharing protocol, All right? Now I'll hand it over to Rafael to go through this in a bit more detail about the standardization. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dina. So we've been working, <coughs> excuse me, on this protocol for a while. <clears throat> it was called uh, ODAP before. We've been working for this for around two years. So there's, there has been a, a couple iterations in the meantime. Uh, but what we figured out is for gateways to communicate securely, we would have to implement a three-phase protocol that's crash fault tolerant to account for possible failures in, in gateways, which would eventually happen. They coordinate asset exchanges, asset transfers, and they can also share data across chains. Um, and we also try for cross-chain transactions to preserve ACID-like properties. So the atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability for uh, transactions that come you know, from the database research area. We have done um, some work. So we have a paper on that formalizes all that. So uh, SATP, uh, previous name, uh, which you can uh, check for some details if you're interested. So this is a sketch of the three phases that ODAP has, well, plus phase zero. First, we have an end user that requests a cross-chain asset transfer. Um, and we have basically gateways communicating to assert their identities and to assert that they can effectively transfer their asset. So they verify the asset profile that defines what an asset should look like. They verify that gateways are ran by a valid uh, virtual asset service providers. They verify the identities and so on. So we, we, we need this kind of standardization because uh, to bring, in order to bring interoperability to the enterprise world, we need some sort of um, agreements on the semantic, organizational, and perhaps even legal layer. Otherwise, if we keep using um, a set of ad hoc standards, it would be much harder to communicate and to abide by existing regulations. Well, after that, the gateways agree to proceed and they establish a secure channel, so uh, TLS, etc., etc. And this is where things start to get interesting. We have our protocol is based on two-phase commit. So first, there is a lock asset or a lock state. So notice that these locks might be 
blocks on state according also to the framework we're developing. So we need the ledgers to have some functionality to uh, create and coordinate such locks. And uh, when we have uh, a lock operation uh, on either side, we generate a proof that should be verifiable by other gateways. Right? So the, the evidence is signed, it's uh, preferably published in a decentralized forum, and um, the receipts are exchanged. After we have a lock, so it's, uh, it corresponds to the pre-commit phase of the two-phase commit protocol, we do the final commit, so the, the lock final, where we issue a transaction, a second transaction against the, the origin blockchain, and then a transaction against the target blockchain, doing the lock and lock, for example, or any arbitrary logic that we decide it's part of the use case. Uh, proofs are generated, they're exchanged, they're persisted, and the gateway concludes the session. So this is the high level overview of the protocol. Then we have the architecture draft, which specifies the components, um, uh, specifies and explains the gateway paradigm, right? You have here a, uh, an idea of where gateways are, lo are located. We have a data sharing protocol. So here we um, design the concept of views done initially by our colleagues at IBM, but also we have more recent work on, on views. And we use this concept of view as the proof that some computation happen on, <coughs> excuse me, either blockchains. And finally, we have the use cases draft um, made by Rama and Thomas, which depicts several real world use cases that can be used or that can benefit from our gateway paradigm. So this is all ongoing work. Um, you're all invited to, to collaborate on this if you have some uh, interest in this area. Yeah, we have a mailing list, we have an open source repo with the drafts, the meetings, everything is posted publicly, uh, a la EITF. Um, and also, please get involved with uh, our Hyperledger um, community. I don't know how it will be with the Cacti channels, but I suppose there will be yeah. a channel. That's why I said TBC to, to be combined. Exactly. Um, I think there is also, uh, Thomas maintains this uh, web3.mit.edu webpage where uh, he collates all the resources from the standardization working group and related things. So that's another place. Right. You can reach. Uh, and it's important to note that it's uh, an inter interdisciplinary area where we need expertise, ex especially on the specific verticals where this would be applied. So we think that interoperability is complex. Um, coming up with a general enough model that's powerful enough to be instantiated on practical implementations. It does, is not being an easy task <laughs> for now, but we believe that it, it's important to be done and it will help alleviate attacks. We are concentrating some of, the, of these efforts at Hyperledger, so which we think it's the ideal place to conjugate these different skills. Um, we've seen that um, not all ledgers in principle can express uh, the full power of interoperability, and we also would like to invite you to collaborate with us on this matter. And yeah, um, as I already mentioned, Hyperledger is a suitable venue to combine people with different skills. And uh, we appreciate your time here. Thanks a lot, and we're happy to answer any questions. Ah, uh, by the way, uh, please go to the mic if you, if you have any questions. Hello. Hey. I uh, was really interested in your P level, C level. Uh, curious if there's information about the different interoperability, uh, let's just say code bases that exist within Hyperledger or Hyperledger Labs, uh, specifically Cactus, Weaver, UE, Perun, and Firefly. And if, you, if we have any ideas about what their P levels and C levels are. Um, Thanks, uh, Tracy, for the question. I think it's an excellent question, and I think it would be very interesting to do that sort, sort of analysis uh, within Hyperledger. Let me get the slide. So, um, Weaver and Cactus aim to be P4, 
Um, so they provide, Weaver provides more the protocol to which you can realize data transfers and asset transfers, while Cactus aims to provide the infrastructure, so the connectors, the test ledgers, and so on. And they, they do realize P4 interoperability, and if you have several Cactus nodes, um, or Cacti nodes in the future, um, hopefully you could realize uh, level C2 and perhaps even level C3. Now, we haven't done a very comprehensive analysis, uh, to the best of my knowledge, to the other uh, solutions, but it's interesting to notice that some of these, in some of these works, uh, the Elsors use, for example, Hyperledger Fabric. They do a channel-to-channel -channel interoperability or interoperability across Hyperledger Fabric networks. So the system that the systems that are proposed in some of those uh, papers works uh, actually enhance the levels of the of the solutions. Although the solutions natively um, do not interoperate with each other, and that happens across several hyperledger projects, uh, which also brings the question: Should we consider hyperledger fabric level P4 because someone has developed a bridge, or should we consider the bridge technology itself providing level P4? Probably is the later. Um, uh, unless Fabric has these interoperability capabilities by default, which happens in some blockchain projects like Cosmos and Polkadot, uh, where you have some interoperability between instances of the platform. So between parachains or between hubs, but you do not have native interoperability with uh, other blockchains. You need bridges for that. So, um, and, and this is a design decision, right? Polkadot, for example, started working on this uh, modules by default, while Hyperledger focused on um, a single blockchain for enterprise uh, applications. And one Thanks. caveat is also about uh, what's the end goal that the project's aiming for versus the current implementation. I guess for some of the projects, the end goal is like what uh, Rafael mentioned, but I think we are working towards that, right? Like we don't have all the things implemented yet, let's say, yeah, for cactus. Thanks for your question. You said that uh, the blockchains that are participating in the transfer need certain basic uh, capabilities. So in terms of that, have you uh, analyzed the existing, especially public blockchains, and um, the uh, assets that are locked in them in terms of the value? Uh, and have you, you know, what kind of assets would be available for this transfer based on the base level of um, capabilities that, uh, that uh, you know, percentage-wise, like, you know, total value locked in all blockchains, right. and how much would be really available using uh, this basic definition, like what... Uh, no, that's what something that uh, that will be good to do once we complete the formalization, like we haven't done it yet, but uh, that's certainly something we have to do, right? Uh, we currently... Whenever we think about something, we'll first sanity check that with Fabric, Besu, and the, the Hyperledger projects, right? Or, and just Ethereum, right? But for the other, uh, we haven't done a thorough uh, check on like, what are the other public blockchains do? We probably have to do it like once we make some more progress in completing the formalization. So what, uh, you said, uh, what is that? Uh uh, capability for oh, locking, locking, locking and uh, some level of synchronization in the clocks, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I mean, what I meant by some level of synchronization clocks is we have to be, have some level of predictability in locks. It should not be too fast or too slow, right? And also it should be uh, not too variable in terms of, uh, like, yeah, it should not suddenly be too fast and then slow down bit and so on. If we do those kind of things, it's very hard to uh, do interoperability. It's hard to define any kind of formal properties for uh, interoperability, right? So that's one part. The second part is should have the ability to uh, facilitate locks. Right? Those are the two things I mentioned in the slide. If 
That's what you're talking about. So when you say that, uh, you you mean the rate at which blocks are formed. Yeah. Uh, so some cl uh, some net most of the networks assume have that as an abstraction for time. So in that in that case, it's the rate at which the blocks are formed. Yeah. And we we obviously need to account for that because different blockchains have different block creation times, or they have even timestamps. Think, for example, in the case of Fabric, we do not have timestamps, time which could uh, make it more difficult to have a, a decentralized view of time. There is actually some papers working on that, or they're, they're already published. So we need to account these different finalization velocities so for our C interop um, instantiation, so Cacti, for example, to be able to synchronize uh, times in a more absolute way. Well, clock synchronization is a tough problem, as you know. Uh, you know, it's, it's not, like it's not as it's, it's not really solved. I agree. <laughs> so we are not trying to synchronize clocks, right? Yeah, it's no, like some like, notion of clocks. Uh, yeah. So what we are saying is, it has to have some level of. Uh, it's not about synchronization, right? It's some level of predictability. Maybe that's a better word we could have used, right? So if, if, if there is a, a decent amount of margin in terms of predictability, then it's easy to, uh, then it's possible to define interop interoperability, right, formally. What we are saying is if they don't have it, then you cannot have any formal guarantees with a protocol that you, with these blockchains as the underlying, I mean the participating networks for interop. Maybe you can ask, I will repeat. If you yeah. <laughs> Uh, what about message-based uh, interoperability, which you know has been brought up as a not just a topic but even a solution? There's a kind of a standard at the World Economic Forum. Can you elaborate? Uh, maybe uh, I'm it's not like aware. It's a swift of... message type system where you're uh, sending asset from one place to another, but obviously that need, it's not a completely decentralized system. You know. Oh. Yeah, because, uh, because you have to have uh, intermediaries uh, who... Who have to be trusted, right? If they go down, then, uh, I mean, you well, have to... I mean, the, the whole uh, financial system in the world exists today, and it transfers trillions of dollars. I agree. Uh, okay, so the, it, it's a working system. It's not like some uh, creation from the mind. Right. So SWIFT is a message-based system, and I think... Uh, somebody in the supply chain world came up with this message-based interoperability for a certain, I mean, it's almost like a fungible token because in the end you can spend it, uh, you know, in, a, in different places. I mean, that's, that's what dri drives, for example, trade finance. You know, you can sell a, a bill of lading mm -hmm. or a uh, so they have formalized something there. I wonder whether you guys have taken a look at it. So that's uh, a bit of the work that we're doing with the SATP protocol, right? So it's message-based. It's uh, inspired by uh, such protocols and problems in the supply chain world uh, where messages are just bit strings and they're interpreted differently by um, different uh, networks. So we have the gateway layer that does that translation, that business level translation, and has some accountability guarantees. That's why we've uh, envisioned it to be uh, better placed as, uh, the gateways to be better placed as uh, centralized. So run at least by centralized authority that can have accountability if a gateway misbehaves and tries to steal funds. Is that what you meant by message based interrupt? I was just assuming maybe it might be something Different. Yeah, I mean, um, what do you mean? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, sounds good. We'll take it offline. Thanks. I think just to add, uh, so yeah, I mean, the protocol that Rafael talked about, uh, one that involves gateways communicating with each other, you can make that as decentralized or as centralized as you want. You can add, add centralized components to make it perform better, to add more trust, and companies like Swift are trying to do that. I guess what the SATP initiative is trying to do is to uh, propose a protocol that uh, gives you a very general way 
to get two networks communicating communicating messages with, e with each other. Now you can adapt that for your purpose if you want. You can bring in uh, trusted parties, middlemen, uh, if you want. So the protocol does not uh, prevent you from doing that. Thanks a lot for the codification, Rama. I guess uh, these are two different views, right? One yeah. is a formalized, you know, a mathematical formalization of this, and the other is uh, um, the the guys in WAF are just trying to figure out what should be in that message. Correct. And uh, and uh, basically, the and the different variants of the protocol. Yeah. Right? Well, so, I mean, I think yeah. it's a, it's a view, you know. One is a, a very right. formal, very uh, you know precise definition, and the other is. I I think the standardization effort tries to create a platform where you can adapt it to, like, uh, whichever level of uh, I don't know, like the parameter uh, parameters or variants of the protocol that you want to support. Formalization tries to say that okay, if you have these such property, if, if you do it in such ways, then it satisfies these properties formally. Yeah, right? so the, the formalization to the, uh, the bridge from the formalization to the real world yeah. are practical implementations and use cases. And to make them more robust, we try to work on standardization as well. So it's a full stack of interoperability. I think we're on time. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and um, see you around. Yeah, if you have any questions. Okay.